Hey everybody, it's Eric Letterman here. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 7. Today I explore Christmas and taxes. This is Faith and Coffee. Before we get into today's topic, I want to take just a moment and thank you for watching. If you're checking out Faith and Coffee for the first time, welcome. I'm still new at this whole vlogging thing. When I first started blogging back in 2008, 2009, I wanted to unpack something that I had been experiencing with a lot of Christians and something I've heard about from a lot of either non-Christians or former Christians. There's this idea that Christian faith is about this, this personal and private piety. I wanted to explore what faith could look like in more practical terms in the everyday, not in a way that puts other people down or is all about judging who is getting into heaven and the kind of faith that I hear Jesus calling us to is a faith that leads us to, to study our scriptures, that is to learn our faith traditions, and then to go out into the world to experience God out there. When we're able to share the experience of God in the ordinary and the everyday, well, we are inviting people to maybe discover some of the same stuff for themselves. I don't believe we are called to impose our faith on other people. We're called to share, but also that means listening and learning from other people's experiences. To follow Jesus is to take on a posture of, of humility and awe at the wonder of God's work within us and all around us, and a spirit of discovery at the amazing diversity of this creation. Our faith calls us to seek peace in ourselves, in one another, and in the world. The problem as I see it is that Jesus's activist, nonviolent peace revolution was sparked from within occupation and oppression. Most of the folks in the churches that I've served and in the Christian communities that I've had the honor of being a part of are actually in positions of power and privilege. And well, I'm not convinced that Christianity does very well when it's in a position of power or privilege. Faith and Coffee was born as an exploration in practical theology, the practice of seeking God in the ordinary and the everyday things in order to see the world as much as is possible as God sees it. Whether you're watching this on my website at faithandcoffee.com or on YouTube or on Facebook at facebook.com slash faithandcoffee, I invite your conversation. Join me in this exploration by leaving your comments down below. In order to grow this thing and invite more people, I need your help. Invite others to watch and to share in a discussion about faith and society. If there are questions or topics you'd like to explore, please let me know. I know I don't have all the answers and that's not even the point of all this. It's to invite responses rather than answers. I also invite your corrections or alternate views, but I ask you to at least be respectful of others who may not share them. I do reserve the right to delete comments that I find offensive and not helpful to our conversation. I hope you can understand that. Okay, that's enough of that. On with the rest of the episode. So what could possibly be the connection between Christmas and taxes? Well, here's the thing. Our Congress is passing a massive tax bill over a ream of paper long, and most of our leaders haven't even read what was originally proposed. According to Congress's own Joint Committee on Taxation, what is so far being proposed will cost over $1.4 trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Now some, including the staff of the Joint Committee, have suggested that the amount is actually only one trillion. Here's how they get it. The $1.4 trillion loss in revenue is balanced by an estimated $460 million revenue increase. Where does the $460 million in revenue come from? That is a good question. Mainly through a massive tax rate cut for corporations and tax cuts in areas that really only the super rich can even take advantage of. Now that's not revenue, it's just saving. Proponents allege that all of this will help create jobs and increase overall production output. By the Joint Committee's own estimates, it will increase output by about 0.8%, less than 1% 
over 10 years. So I don't get it. Tax cuts for the rich and the super rich, as well as for corporations, which are, according to the Supreme Court, actually people that you can't touch or talk to and only exist on paper. And somehow all those tax breaks are supposed to trickle down into new jobs for middle and lower classes. Gosh, this all sounds awfully familiar. By lowering everyone's tax rates all the way up the income scale, each of us will have a greater incentive to climb higher, to excel, to help America grow. This is the percentage of new income that went to the bottom 90%. Whoa! What happens in 1982? We are into trickle-down economics. Fundamental to the Christian faith is that God is the creator of all things, and nothing God created can be called unclean or unworthy. It's not a position of privilege to be a child of God. It is, however, a calling to live in such a way that recognizes the, the interconnectedness of all things. So when one thing is hurt or suffering, that suffering reverberates across the entire web of creation. To love God is to love what God has created, to care for it and, and seek its well-being. So when we hurt folks in order to embolden others, the whole system ultimately suffers. This is not a zero-sum game where it all balances out if you take a little over here and put it over here. This is about caring for an entire system. Hurt reverberates way more than help. So it takes a double portion of help to heal the hurt. And it seems those advocating for this tax plan are following an old playbook most notably used in the 1980s. Tax cuts for the rich, creating an even larger budget deficit, and adding to our national debt. Then in a few years, as things get worse and the trickle down never really happens, the real agenda comes out. We have to balance the budget. We have to cut social welfare programs aimed at helping the most vulnerable of our society because we can't afford it. So we have to cut Medicare and Medicaid, the SNAP credits, the, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. It used to be called food stamps. We've seen this before and it didn't work. Whoa! In fact, it did a lot of damage and we ended up in recession because of the, the continued concentration of wealth at the top was unsustainable. I'm not an economist, but my education has been focused on political science, social systems, as well as theological and biblical studies. And this whole tax plan is part of an oligarchic plutocracy that seeks to further embolden the already wealthy and powerful, make it harder for people to move up economically, and keep the poor and the middle class in check. It will simply further suppress them. And I have to ask, is that the real plan? The vast majority of those serving in Congress, especially our Republican friends, claim to be Christian. Yet this entire tax plan seems to be based on values completely opposite of what Jesus and most of our scriptures teach. All this as we head into Christmas, the, the Christ Mass, the Feast of the Messiah, the Feast of the, the Savior of the poor and the marginalized. Seriously? Any fiscal plan that ignores or even seeks to hurt the poor, the sick, the elderly, the young, or otherwise vulnerable is not a plan that is based on Christian values. I keep hearing folks on the right talk about how the U.S. is a Christian nation, a notion I do not share. Yet they are the first ones to cut welfare, to line the already gold-plated coffers of the rich, and continue to grow an already engorged military budget that they conveniently call defense though it seems to be more for protecting global corporate interests than actual real people. Many have said that budgets reveal the true priorities or, or values of a community or nation. Yes, our government spends nearly two thirds of its overall budget, including mandatory and discretionary funds, on social security and Medicare programs. But remember that each of us pays a handsome portion of our income into these retirement and health programs. And much of the money that is actually being paid out was put in by the very people who are receiving it. The next smallest number is, you guessed it, military spending. In 2015, over 16% of a $3.8 trillion budget went to military defense. That's over $600 billion. Compare that to education, which received a very small 3% sliver, or $102 billion. That works out to be about $2,000 per K-12 student in the U.S. The rest of the $11,000 it costs to actually educate each student per year on average 
comes from local and state sources. Then there are the lucky schools who have wealthy parent-teacher organizations or booster clubs who help support teachers and extracurricular activities. Schools in poor neighborhoods do not get such support. Here in Arizona, the third lowest spender on education pays just $7,500 per student, which includes teachers and administrators, support staff, facility maintenance, supplies, everything, except all the money that teachers and parents put in themselves to buy things like copy paper and pencils and other classroom supplies that our schools cannot afford. What happens in poor neighborhoods if budgets reflect priorities? Where are our priorities in the US? What do we value? Certainly not an educated population which I'm sure would suit some congressional leaders just fine because an uneducated populace is a more easily manipulated populace. So here's the question I have for our congressional leaders who are supporting this ridiculous tax bill. As you think about voting on not only massive tax breaks for corporations who already pay much lower taxes than what the tax rates indicate because they get massive deductions and other breaks, as well as voting on taking away medical care from those caught in the gap between Medicaid and actually being able to afford a health care plan. As you vote on taking away tax deductions for medical care, student loans, moving costs, tax preparation, environmental savings initiatives like buying an electric car, and so much more, I'm curious, what values are you basing your decision on? And if you are Christian, my legislative leaders, on what scriptural value are you basing your decision on? If this passes next year, I don't want to hear anything in your next campaign about faith values, family values, or community, because you're basically saying in this vote that none of those things really matter. So happy Advent, and may you have a very Merry Christmas. I don't remember who originally said it, but our budgets, and therefore our tax rules, are moral documents that clearly state where our values as a nation and as a people truly lie. Do these things really reflect your values? If they don't, then contact your senators and representatives and let them know. I'm Eric Letterman. This has been Faith and Coffee. And, and we'll, we'll see, see you, you next time. time. Blah.